This lecture is part of an online mathematics course on group theory and will be mostly about the structure of finitely generated abelian groups. So in previous lectures, we've done groups of order up to 15. So the next thing to look at is order 16. And as we will see next lecture, there are a rather a lot of groups of order 16. And we're just going to look at the abelian groups of order 16. And let's write down the abelian groups we can think of that are of order 16. Well, there's Z modulo 16Z. And then we can take products like Z modulo 8Z times Z modulo 2Z, Z modulo 4Z times Z modulo 4Z, Z modulo 4Z times Z modulo 2Z times Z modulo 2Z, and Z modulo 2Z times Z modulo 2Z times z modulo 2z times z modulo 2z. So these are the obvious abelian groups of order 16. And the question is, are there any others? And if we think about the abelian groups we've had earlier in the course, they can all be written as products of cyclic groups. For example, the groups we had in the previous lecture, z over nz, star all turn out to be products of cyclic groups. So um, it's not true that every abelian group is a product of cyclic groups. For instance, the, the um, rational numbers Q, so these are the rationals um, under the group operation of addition is not a product or sum of cyclic groups, which is fairly easy to check. So it's certainly not true that every abelian group is uh, a product of cyclic groups. However, and um, we have the following theorem, every finite abelian group is a product of cyclic groups of prime power, we can even take them to be a, of prime power order. So they're cyclic groups of the form Z over P to the N. Um, well, it turns out that the proof of this works just as well if we, instead of using finite groups, we talk about finitely generated groups. So um, a set of elements generates a group if, if a group if every element of the group can be written as, as products of elements in this set. Um, well, if we allow finitely generated groups, then we have to allow not only cyclic group Z over P to the N Z, but we also have to allow the group Z. See, um, any cyclic group of order Z over kz for some integer k can be written as a product of groups of prime power order, but if, if, if we're allowing infinite groups, we also have to allow z. Um, so um, what we're going to do is to show how to prove this. Um, there's actually a more general result. Um, which we won't prove, but whose proof that the proof of it is almost the same as this, which says that any finitely generated module over a Euclidean ring is a sum of cyclic modules. So if this ring is R, the cyclic module is going to be R over A times R. Okay, I'm not going to explain what a module over a ring is because we're not actually going to use this result. But the case we're doing um, is where if you take the ring R to be the ring of integers, then a, finite, then a module over the integers is just the same as an abelian group. So this result just says that a finite abelian group is a sum of cyclic groups. Um, anyway, um, the main property of the integers we use is 
is the following one. If we've got integers a and b, with b greater than zero, we can divide a by b, getting a quotient and a remainder, with the remainder being less than b. So this is the, so q is the quotient. If we divide a by b, and we get a quotient of q, and um, we have uh, a remainder left over. And the, the key point is that the remainder has to be less than the number we divided by. Um, a Euclidean ring is one which has a similar division with remainder where the absolute value may not be the absolute value on the integer, so it will be something else like, say, the degree of a polynomial or something like that. So this is the property we're going to use. Now what we do is um, we take some generators for the abelian group. So let's take some generators g1 up to gk. And we're going to write the group additively because it's abelian. And we look at some relations between these generators. So, so relations between generators are just some, um, some group operation on these generators that produces zero. So the relations might be something like n11 g1 plus n12 g2 plus, plus n1 k gk equals zero. So this would be a typical relation. It says that some multiple of g1 plus some multiple of g2 and so on is zero. So all these numbers n, i, j are going to be integers. And then we might have another relation, n12 g2 plus n22 g2 plus n2k gk equals zero. n13 g, what's that? That should be g1 g1 and so on, n14, g1 and so on. So we write down lots of relations. You can even write down an infinite number of relations if you like. The point is we should write down enough relations um, to, force, um, uh, to, to, to force the group generated by these to be the abelian group we're interested in. We can always arrange this by writing down every possible relation between the generators of our group, which will give us an infinite number. But as I said, that's that will actually be harmless in, in the following proof. So we've, we, we, we've, we, we write down enough relations to specify our group. And now we're, we're going to manipulate these relations and get them into a nicer form. It's rather tiresome writing um, all these relations out. So instead of writing out all the Gs and the Ns, we just write down a matrix N11, N12 up to N1K n21 and so on up to n2k and so on so this is a possibly infinite matrix and we're going to think what can we do to the matrix without changing the group so operations on this matrix so first of all we can add multiple it's an integer multiple of one column to another. And the reason is that if we've got generators G and H, so if the generators contain G and H and other things, then we can change to G and g plus n times h for any n in the integers. Because if, if these two and some other elements generate the group, then obviously these two and vice versa. And the effect on the relations will be to some column, do some operation to the, to the columns containing g and h. You'll either add or subtract n times one of these columns for the other. And I'm not going to tell you which because I'd, I'd almost certainly get it the wrong way around if I tried. Secondly, we can add a multiple of one row to another. 
And this is again fairly obvious because if R1 and R2 are relations, then R1 and R2 plus N R1 are equivalent relations. So if we know R1 and R2 are zero, then we know that these two are zero. And if we know that these two are zero, then we know that those two are zero. So we can do all the usual row and column operations on matrices without affecting the group, um, uh, uh, without affecting our abelian group. And now what we do is we do these row and column operations to make the top left entry n11 as small as possible. Um, when we say as small as possible, we mean that the absolute value of n11 should be as small as possible, um, but greater than zero. Um, so we've now got n11, n12, and so on, and n21. So now we can subtract um, now multiples of the first row and column from the others to make um, all entries N12, N13, and so on, and N21 n22 and sorry n31 and so on equal to zero now we can do this because n12 must be a multiple of n11 if it wasn't we could subtract multiples of n11 from n12 in order to get a remainder that was smaller than n11 and then we could switch um we could just switch the columns by rearranging the generators and find a smaller number positive number N11. So N11 divides all these, and therefore we can just clear them out by subtracting the first column from all the other columns and the first row from all the other rows. So we get N11, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, N22, N23, and so on. So we can turn our matrix of generators and relations into this form. And now we can just repeat this. So we forget about the first row and the first column and just repeat the same, same thing on this smaller matrix here. And what we end up with is something that looks like this. We've got N11, N22, N33, up to NKK, and all the other entries are zero. Then we can throw away all rows of the form 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, because a relation that telling you that 0 is equal to 0 is not really terribly useful, and you may as well discard it. So what have we got? We've got our group has generators G1 up to GK and relations N11 G1 equals zero, N22 G2 equals zero, and so on. And um, this is just the same as saying, so the group is isomorphic to Z over N11Z. So this is going to be generated by G1 times Z over N22Z, generated by G2, and so on. And now we can just sort of finish up by replacing Z over NZ um, is, is isomorphic to Z over P1 to the N1 Z times Z over P2 to the N2 Z and so on, where N is equal to P1 to the N1, P2 to the N2 and so on. So we can assume that all these groups are actually cyclic of prime power order, except that N might be zero. So Z over zero Z is just isomorphic to Z. So any finitely generated abelian group can be written as products of cyclic groups of prime power order. 
and products of z and of course if the group is finite we, we, we don't get this case and we just get groups of prime power order so um well this is quite nice on the other hand it means there's not really it's kind of difficult to think of anything very interesting to say about finite abelian groups because they're all known and have such an easy structure um you can also ask is the um, when are two finite abelian groups isomorphic? So suppose G is isomorphic to Z over P1 to the N1, Z times Z over P to the N, P2 to the N2, Z, and so on. We can ask, are P1, N1, P2, N2, and so on determined? Well, obviously they're not because you can just change the order. So let's say determined up to order. And if we don't insist that th these are prime powers, then this obviously isn't true because z over 6z is isomorphic to z over 2z times z over 3z. So we've got to be a bit careful that we're not getting a complication like this turning up. And the answer is yes. Um, for example, we can see this as follows. Um, um, if, if we've got z over p1 to the n1, z times z to the p1 to the n2, z, and so on times p1, z over p1 to the n3, z, and so on. So the number of times p1 to the something occurs is determined. And the reason it's determined is determined by the number of elements of order P, P1 in G. You can see the number of elements of order P1 plus 1 is, is going to be P for this factor times P for this factor times P for this factor. So we know how many times some power of P1 occurs. And similarly, um, the number of elements of order P squared then determines the number of times we get P to the two plus something in the denominator. If we know the if we know the number of times some power of p occurs in the denominator, and we know the number of elements of order p squared, by thinking about it a bit, you'll see you can figure out the number of times we get one of these denominators with the ni at least two. And by continuing like that, you can figure out the exponents of all prime powers in the group. So the group is uniquely determined by these prime powers. Um, so we can now determine the number of groups of order p to the n. So how many abelian groups of order p to the n are there? Well, um, if we write n is equal to a plus b plus c and so on with a greater than root to b greater than root to c greater than zero, then we get a group um, z over p to the a times z over p to the b times z over p to the c and so on. And this gives a one-to-one -one correspondence between abelian groups of order p to the n and ways of writing n like this. So the number of groups is equal to the number of partitions of n. So the partitions of n are just the solutions of n equals a plus b plus c with a greater than b greater than equal c and so on greater than zero. Just the number of ways of writing n as a sum of positive integers where we ignore um, order. Um, so we can look at the first few cases of this. So 
let's write out the number n and look at the number of partitions of it. So if n is zero, there's just one partition, if you think about it, because naught is actually an empty sum of integers. If n equals one, there's one partition, which is just one, two, we get two, two or one plus one, three, we get three, three, two plus one, one plus one plus one, four, we get five, three, whoops, four, three plus one, two plus two, two plus one plus one, and one plus one plus one plus one. And you see these corresponded to the groups of order 16. We had z over two to the four z, z over two cubed z times z over two z, and so on. Uh, for five, we get seven, which is getting five, four plus one, three plus two, three plus one plus one, two plus two plus one, two plus one plus one plus one, one plus one plus one plus one plus one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'm, uh, it's obvious how this goes on. And it's getting a bit boring writing these out, so I'm not going to go any further. Um, the number of partitions of an integer is a um, rather remarkable function that's heavily studied in number theory, but this is a group theory, not a number theory course, so I won't say much more about it. Um, i just finished by mentioning that there is a very close correspondence between the theorem that says that every finite abelian group is a product of groups of the form z over p to the n z. And the following theorem it says every matrix over the complex numbers has a Jordan normal form. So you remember a Jordan normal form means you write it as a whole lot of blocks down the diagonal where each block has an eigenvalue and one's up there. So there might be a lambda there and a lambda. I guess these should be different eigenvalues, but anyway. So you remember a Jordan normal form of a matrix has blocks down the diagonal and each block has the eigenvalue down the diagonal and one's just above it. And at first glance, this theorem seems to have nothing to do with the structure of abelian groups. But in fact, they're almost the same theorem. So this theorem works for modules over Z. That means abelian groups acted on by Z, which is just the same as abelian groups. For this, you look at um, modules over the ring of polynomials over the complex numbers. Well, what is a module over the ring of polynomials over the complex numbers? Well, a module means an abelian group acted on by this in a nice way. So a module is just a vector space with a linear transformation. So saying it's acted on by C means it's a vector space over C and saying it's also acted on by C of X means it must have a linear transformation, which is just the action of X. Now we said that finite abelian groups are sums of cyclic ones, Z over p to the n z, where z is prime. And if you, uh, the, the corresponding theorem for modules over polynomials just says that every module is a sum of modules of the following form. You take c of x over p to the n times c of x, where p is now an irreducible polynomial. So an irreducible polynomial um, in the ring of polynomials are just like primes in the ring of integers. Well, the irreducible polynomials over the complex numbers are just of, of the form x minus alpha for alpha a complex number. And if you work out what these modules are, they're just vector spaces with a linear transformation such that x minus alpha to the n um, equals one. And it's not very difficult to show that if you do that, you can find a basis which looks like alpha, 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 
one 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 where there are n rows. So the Jordan decomposition of a complex matrix is almost exactly the same as writing a finite abelian group as a product of cyclic groups. You can the, 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 the proof of these two theorems is almost identical. You just change the ring from the integers to the ring of polynomials. Um, so next lecture we will discuss the non-abelian groups of order 16 without actually classifying them because as we will see there's so many of them that 